they are in a world of hurt. We're complaining about a couple percent of inflation. They got 150%. This is a country in 1900 that used to, people used to say as rich as in Argentine because it was 30% richer than Spain and Italy. People moved to Argentina to form a new life. And now the poverty rate is 50%. Welcome to the Cashflow Academy podcast. This is where we do our very best to make things simple. And today we're, that we've got our work cut out for us. We have a tremendously complex topic. We're going to speaking about, uh, be speaking about sovereign debt and debt defaults. I, 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 I'm blown away. I got to give a shout out to my producers, their ability to find the perfect people to talk about topics that, that I've asked them to research and, and they're just fantastic and they never cease to amaze. Uh, we have Gregory Makoff. And I want to make sure I pronounce your name right, uh, Gregory. Gregory Makoff. Is that right? Yes, it's Makoff. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. And uh, he, once again, uh, I find myself speaking to someone that's far above my pay grade. Uh, he's got a PhD in physics. He's worked in the banking industry. Uh, he's a tremendous mind, and he's a specialist and an expert in international sovereign debt. He's worked with many foreign countries. And I'll let him introduce himself just a bit. Um, little shout out uh, to my team. Uh, check out our website. It's called yourinvestingclass.com. And uh, you can get some goodies there. Always at no charge. Learn a little bit more about how you can structure your financial education. <laughs> but uh, Gregory Makoff, welcome to the show. And thanks for being here with us. Well, thank you, Andy. Thank you for having me. I love your commitment to financial education. And I hope this episode is educational. And you asked about my background. Um, the short version, I've been obsessed with sovereign debt, government debt, emerging markets since the 80s. I went to college in the 80s when what they called the less developed country debt crisis. If you remember, Citibank and all the big banks had lent all this money. Then Volcker started raising rates to yes. tame our inflation, and he toppled all the developing countries who'd borrowed from banks floating rate. They had other problems. They had <laughs> commodity cost problems, other things. Dozens defaulted at the same time and wallowed in a lost decade for, for 10 years longer for others and only got out of them through what was called Brady programs. I was a college student. I was a majoring, majoring in physics with a, call it a minor in political science and in Boston, I went to a lot of talks about that. I decided to get my PhD in physics. So I was in the lab for seven years, barely paying attention. And when I came out, I said, I wanna get back into that bigger world and went to Wall Street, worked in the bond market, worked with developing countries, worked with companies in developing countries and in Asia, in Africa, a lot in South America, and really got to experience. The 90s were a great period when the countries had recovered from this lost decade, but then we have this period where a few of the countries, like Argentina, keep getting in trouble when most of the region has graduated and after 20 years of working, <laughs> I wanted to take a short sabbatical to write a book to collect what I learned in my working career. And that short sabbatical is now hitting 10 years. But I'm <laughs> glad to finish the project and be here talking. Well, your book is called Default, the Landmark Court Battle over Argentina's $100 billion debt restructuring. And this is not going to be light reading, uh, you know, if, if uh, you know, why, why bring this to such a broad audience? And I'll, I'll give people a little context of why I think this is essential. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, uh, everyone has their different challenges. And, and one of the challenges that my wife and I uh, hit together a couple of years ago, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And the very first thing we did when we said, okay, we have a big challenge and something that's life threatening. We started looking at case studies of other people. And it was interesting because they have a wonderful technology called a mammoprint where they can take her cancer cells and they can go out and they can, com they can compare it in a database. Uh, fa fabulous technology, like a fingerprint, a mammoprint. 
and they can find someone in her exact situation and and see how they reacted what different treatments worked, what didn't, and it creates a case study uh, for you to look at to guide you on what you might be experiencing, what treatments might work best or not for you. And as I look at <clears throat> financial cancer, which can happen, uh, and I look at my home country, the United States, you know, how does this work? And when you look at Argentina, uh, in the 80s, they have this tremendous inflation, uh, they have, uh, I don't want to over dramatize it, but, but, you know, from what I know about it, it seemed like their environment went much more from civil to and social, perhaps a little bit primal. Uh, they have five presidents in a month go through. So politically it's a revolving door and people are, there's a leadership vacuum <clears throat> and it really is a wonderful study to say, you know, what happens when when sovereign debt and default which your terms will define here in a bit you know what happens when when when, when you have a, a financial cancer going out of control so that's the first thing why i think if you can take time and study what's happened to other people often you can get somewhat of a guide of what might happen or or you know what the environment might be like for you but the second thing and i'm really glad you brought this up before we officially went on the air, I suppose, is there's a couple of different contexts in which a person can study. And I'm going to label these, uh, hopefully not too, uh, hopefully I can find some eloquence in this. There is something called a uh, rhetorical context in which many people live. And what rhetorical contexts are is when you want an outcome and you've kind of made the decision first. You know, an attorney would have this. Well, I'm going to prove the innocence. And I'm really going to welcome evidence that, that supports my case, but I'm going to shun evidence that doesn't support my case. Uh, <clears throat> you know, clergy might be in this. You know, the, <clears throat> the great uh, story of Galileo when he discovers that the, we have a geocentric system or a, a, a heliocentric system and the church says, no, 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 no. Uh, it's a rhetorical context. Opposite to that would be a science context like veridical, where ver you know the veritas, the truth, where we're really looking for the truth, uh, and we step up aside from agenda. In other words, I would take off my Democrat hat, or I would take off my Republican hat for just a moment, and I would simply be a judge. And uh, as as we spoke earlier, every coin has three sides: heads, tails, and the edge. And, intelligence is when you can stand on the edge and see both sides <clears throat> veridically as opposed to rhetorical agenda. So I'm going to invite you to really take off the burden of partisanship because it really is a backpack of rocks. Uh, if you've already decided one group is right and the other group is wrong and you, you know the other guy is evil, that's a backpack that weighs you down from having that veridical context, say, look, I just want to know what the truth is, and I'm excited to learn the facts. And so with that context, because it's, it's hard to speak about sovereign debt without policy, because monetary policy and fiscal policy are intertwined, policy and politics. Uh, so with that context, <laughs> we're going to dig into some, some heavy duty stuff. Anything you want to say about those two ideas of Argentina being a case study? that is relevant and, uh, and perhaps a microcosm for larger countries. Anything you want to say about that veridical context in which you and I enjoy uh, residing? No, thank you very much. And I think I'll even start. Um, I appreciate you sharing your story about your wife's medical issue. I hope she's fine. She's and, doing great. And what you're describing, that trauma of going through a serious medical problem, I'm sympathetic for countries going through deep crisis. And you have a country who usually can't pay because of what the 20 former governments didn't do right. And they get in office because they voted out the other guys. And it's a mess. And it's hurting. There's not enough money for schools. There's not enough money for for police. There's not enough money for health care. People are hurting. They're cutting off people's power. Um, they're not paying bondholders. Bondholders are screaming. So you're in a world of hurt. Unfortunately, 
My book is about Argentina's $100 billion bond default of December 24th, 2001. And the country's back in trouble today. They had an election over financial instability in the fall. They have a new government. There's protests in the street. They are in a world of hurt. We're complaining about a couple percent of inflation. They got 150%. This is a country in 1900 that used to, people used to say as rich as an Argentine because it was 30% richer than Spain and Italy. People moved to Argentina to form a new life. And now the poverty rate is 50%. My heart goes out to people who are struggling. And I, I want to do exactly what you said is study this scientifically because the question is, is I worked in bond markets. I love bonds. You issue a bond with the fixed coupon. You borrow a bond, you build a bridge. You create more business. You create more revenue. Everybody's better off. But 5%, 10% of the time in the developing world, somebody doesn't pay and it's a mess. And it becomes a, sometimes a very deep crisis. And you have to transition from total crisis to normalcy. And that's where the experts in debt restructuring come in and, and do their work to go from abnormal to normal. And the distinguishing factor of Argentina's 2001 default is it took 15 years to clean up that bond default. Countries I worked with cleaned up their defaults in a couple months, in the case of Jamaica, and <coughs> that, or a couple of years, we're talking 15 years, four years to get out an offer and another decade of litigation. So it was like, if you're going to have a case study of, of a country and a deal gone bad, this is the one that breaks everything. But is that more educational? Let's so, dwell. Let, yeah. Let's dwell on that human... There's economic crisis, political crisis, but at the bottom, this is all uh, a human crisis. I mean, the, the birds and the bees and the animals don't even know any of, the, any of this is going on. Only humans know this is going on. Yeah. And, you know, when you look at the United States, for example, well, let me back up. I was in Argentina uh, giving a speech and, and uh, it was wonderful. The, the promoter invited my sons and it was magical. They're probably nine and 10 years old at the time. I actually got on stage and did some speaking. One of the things I used to do to, oh, it was a probably a, a, a low hanging fruit to bring some charm is I'd have my kids talk about it. And we had a little routine we would do. And I'd say to my son, you know, how we started this when he was in the second grade, you know, eight years old. And I'd say, uh, who's going to pay off all of this debt? You know, who's going to do this? He says, us young kids. It was very powerful. And I said, uh, are you old enough to vote? He says, no. I go, so you didn't vote for all these policies. You didn't vote for all this debt. He says, no. I go, but you're going to be the one that pays it off. He says, yes. And I said, well, what's that called? And he said, well, that's taxation without representation. <laughs> <laughs> Today, if a child is born in the U.S., uh, their share of our national debt is about $600,000, that $34 trillion we've already borrowed. You have 212 that we've promised each other in healthcare benefits and, and other things. So if my math is right, uh, that's about $7 million, or excuse me, about $4 million, $4 million per kid that we owe each other when we're born because of promises that were made before we got here. So there's a compassion that, that, a, that any human being must feel for the Argentinian people who have now grown up since 1980 and still reeling from much of what, what has happened politically and their revolving door uh, that way. So the human part of this is, is really can get lost in the big numbers if you're not careful. Food, clothing, electricity, you know, the, these, are, these are human problems that they're trying to solve uh, down there. So I appreciate that. Um, Let's talk a little bit about some definitions. Uh, government debt and sovereign debt. Could you, would you care to clarify that so, we, so as we have our conversation, we understand government debt, sovereign debt, and default. I think those are three terms that we do well to define as we continue. Uh, thank you. And 
as a investor podcast, I I'm a big believer in sovereign debt as an asset class to invest in. There's yield, and it's a trillion dollar asset class. So yeah. not 20, 30 trillion. So government debt is the biggest asset class in the world. US government debt, French yeah. government debt, Japanese government debt, German government debt, Italian government debt. That's bonds, usually fixed rate bonds at a fixed term, US semi-annual pay issued by the government in the local currency under the local law. That's yeah. government debt. Sovereign debt is the word we use when Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, Brazil, Indonesia, South Africa, Philippines borrows in US dollars under New York law or English law. So they're coming into our market. They're using our law. Historically, they did that because they didn't have enough savings. And if they wanted to build a bridge between the two halves of the country to unlock a lot of value and a lot of commerce to make more government revenue and to thrive as a country, they would go and do a 30-year bond and invest it well and thrive with that source of capital. And it was a great source of capital. But that market is, is one that I used to work in. So when I worked in finance, I would go to all those countries and help them with bond deals or help them sometimes when they couldn't pay. So that's a subsector of the market, and it's a subsector of the market that offers extra yield. In the 90s, after most of those countries fixed themselves in their so-called Brady plans, a Mexico bond might trade at 200 basis points, 2% a year over U.S. treasuries. So if you bought a gov U.S. bond at 5%, you can get a Mexico bond at 7%. So it offered a lot of extra yield in U.S. pension funds and insurance companies and asset managers bought a lot of it. They started the market and then it became very big. Um, initially, banks had lent all the money and after the defaults of the 80s, the bank said, we don't want to do this anymore. And so right. then the bond market grew and it became this gigantic asset class growing from a couple hundred billion after the Brady plans to over a trillion. And it's a very diverse, a very liquid market. And most of these countries are SEC registrants. So you can click and get all the data. And there are a lot of good issuers but it's also an error prone universe because some of the countries run bad policies and get in trouble. So when I talk about sovereign debt, I'm talking about a market of bonds for mostly developing borrowers. And, and this creates an interesting uh, problem. If my, if, if someone in my community uh, breaks an agreement with me or, you know, really breaks a law that impacts me, we can go to a U.S. court, you know, a district court or, you know, a Supreme Court or whatever court we want to go to, a circuit court, and we can have our grievances. And there is enforcement that, uh, that, that can enforce laws. And there's also laws like bankruptcy and you know, you have chapter seven, chapter 11, you have chapter nine, if you're a municipality, there's, there's protection. The moment I crossed the border, you know, you know, so I had a, I had an amazing uh, experience. Uh, I had a letter from a person from the Philippines saying, oh, I just love your book. And he had a picture of my book and, you know, it had a, it was uh, in that language. And I thought, that's interesting. I've never published my book in that language. So, <laughs> So I thought, thank you for someone uh, to, you know, someone pirated something. You know, I'm not going to go after that, right? I mean, they're in the Philippines. <clears throat> so there's a, a level of complexity that happens in terms of default, which default, let's just say a failure to keep the commitment, right? You're going to, you promise to pay and you don't. And so you default on that commitment. There's a level of complexity when we start to deal internationally of, you know, how is this, how is this enforced or, forgiven because the laws are local instead of global. Yes? Yes, that's right. But let's take it into parts because that's the very core of the book. But 
the first thing I think we should hit on is what is default. Let's say you lent a $10,000 bond to Zambia. Like, how do you, how do they default? And the short answer of a government defaulting is, it happened to Sri Lanka a year ago, 5 a.m. I'm on my, looking at Twitter or whatever, and I see the press release comes out, Sri Lanka moratorium. And it says, oh. we're really sorry, the government of Sri Lanka is going to, for the time being, not going to pay any of its sovereign bonds. It's not going to pay any of its bilateral creditors. And they've had lawyers. But for this other category and this other category, we're going to keep paying. So it's a very legalistic process. They've worked on it for months. They've studied very hard with IMF and internally. Nobody wants to default. And they've got lawyers to script that thing for them. So you get a notice and you own your bond and you are just praying because your bond matured in three months. And you thought you were going to get out before it hit. And nope, they nailed you. That's the narrow narrow thing. But I've been in countries in default or near default. And default isn't just that notice. It's a cluster of failures. When countries don't have the fiscal capacity to pay their obligations, you know, you've got the family who's having trouble. Someone lost a job. Are you going to pay the water bill? Are you going to pay the power bill? Are you going to pay the car bill? Are you going to pay your mortgage? And then you say, well, if I don't pay the mortgage, how long will it take them to kick me out? Yeah. Because if that takes them three months, I'll probably get a second job by then and then I can make it up. So you get countries who start doing that juggling and they start cutting this and cutting that. And one form of default you can't sue them about is, you know, we get, most people get like a small tax return, a tax um, uh, uh, when they pay you back, uh, reap, uh, what do you call it? Um, you, you overpay and they send you a check. Oh, yeah, they send you a refund, a rebate. Yeah, the tax refund. Sorry, the tax yeah, rebate. Refund. Yeah. They owe you the refund of $1,000. So the governments get all this money, the refund. And then when they're in trouble, they say, oh, you're not getting your refund this year. We owe it to you, but we're going to give it to you when we can pay. So I've been in a troubled country where all the banks were sitting down with the minister while I was working on the debt restructuring. I said, what are they all talking about? Oh, they owe them like hundreds of millions of dollars of tax refunds. I'm like, oh, I didn't know about that. So they're defaulting and suppliers. They're not yeah. paying for anything. And so when you have a country that's failing on everybody at the same time, which it does, defaulting on you as the bondholder is last. So how do you grow a country? How do you do business in a country? How do you thrive in a country with this cluster of defaulting on everything you're supposed to be doing as a government? So I say that because if we think of the risks of financial distress in the United States, we're always going to pay our debts technically because we can print money, but we may not meet all our other obligations if we run out of space. So I just wanted to, to emphasize that point. What is default? It's being in a very abnormal situation where government is financially not doing what it needs to do on a daily basis. Excellent and definition. But here, here's an interesting thought about government bonds, and, and I can see the importance of the distinction between government debt and sovereign debt, because those could be easily uh, blended together in a conversation inadvertently. But here's, a, here's an interesting thing I'd just like to comment on at this point. Uh, there's something uh, in investing we have called a sharp ratio, where we say, what is the unit of reward I'm receiving as, rel as related to the unit of risk that I'm taking. And what it does is it helps an investor understand <clears throat> you know, the risk of their investment. Someone says, oh, I'm getting paid a whole bunch, but they might be taking way more risk per unit of, of reward they're getting. And when you look at a sharp ratio, you need to start with a comparison, right? What is risk? And often they will use a US treasury saying that it's theoretically risk-free. 
which I think is interesting. So you say this is risk-free money, and you mentioned that, well, the government can always print money. Uh, Alan Greenspan famously said on CNBC, well, the government can pay any debt it has because we can always print money to do that. That's his big quote, uh, you know, in the in the 2008-9 nine, nine bubble. On the other side of this, uh, we've had twice that the, that the U.S. has lost their AAA credit rating with two different agencies. One, uh, because of the, you know, the 08 problem. And then more recently, we have the saber rattling uh, every time we need to raise the, the debt ceiling. And the, the credit agency will say, well, look, you know, we see a risk because Democrats and Republicans are so angry with each other that out of just spite, they might not raise the debt ceiling and that could cause problems. Down goes the credit rating. So on one hand, if you have less than AAA, that certainly speaks to risk. But on the other hand, you say, well, this is a risk-free investment. Can you reconcile that for us? Uh, you know, at all? Um, you just, <laughs> you're just bringing up such a ball of different issues um, for that. And given I deal with all these countries around the world, for me, I see the U.S. rate as a risk-free rate. I'm not, I, you know, there is the inflation risk. I trust our country. And it's not perfect. There's a lot to fight about. We've been too loose on monetary policy, but our system is transparent. And inflation went up and they started tightening. And the news has been good so far. Cross our fingers. Yeah. When you look at some of these emerging markets, totally out of control. But our numbers are scary. Our debt to GDP held by the public 2023 is around 98%. By itself, not horrible if we're borrowing at a really low interest rate. If you had no, an emerging market mar emerging market country at double our interest rate, that's a death knell. For us, it's not the worst, but it's the rate it's growing. It's going to go up to 140 in 20 years. Congressional Budget Office has this median uh, long-term budget outlook, June 2023. You only have to look at the one-page summary. All the numbers are there. And... It's like, you know, the magic of compound interest. Yes, yes. It's it's the hockey stick, right? It explodes exponentially, and it's a double-edged sword. It's the genius of investing and retail investing, regular investing, is you put a little away every year. Put 5 or 10% of what you make. Be Take a bit of risk, you know? I like equities for the long term. I believe in America. Yeah, um, have some liquidity because you're going to have to buy stuff or have have emergencies, but let it ride. Let it ride for 40, 50 years while you're working. And when you retire, you're going to be OK. Because compounding works. It's and if you get huge. Yeah. But the problem is when you're a debtor, that magic kills you and it kills you fast. And what makes you rich as a saver kills you as a profligate. And we're on the hockey stick is the problem. At the low level, it doesn't really matter. At the, for the U.S., 30 40% debt to GDP, you can argue with the margin. But once you go over 100, it starts going up fast. So I'm not, like, scared right now. But I think the new government after 2024 elections the congressman, the president, people got to sit down and be reasonable because I'm I'm riding the edge here, as you talked about, because we can't have one party say no tax rises and another party saying no spending cuts. That yeah, where, let, let me define a couple of terms that you used because our, our audience is pretty well read. So most of them are going to follow us, but let's say we have someone new. You mentioned a very important metric when it comes to the sovereign conversation called the debt to GDP ratio. And of course, gross domestic product is what you make. It's the value you bring and manufacture. It's, it's really a good sense of value. So maybe if I took this in a household metaphor, uh, I have a certain income and a certain job I have, and I produce a certain something for my community and that's my source of income. So, uh, Taxes come from GDP. If you picture the pie of, yeah. uh, of what a country does, 
how do they make their money? Well, they pull taxes, and that is always going to be a percentage of GDP. So on the one hand, if I look at my debts and I look at my ability to generate income, that ratio is pretty important. You know, here on one hand is my obligations, and here on my other hand is my ability to fulfill them. And that essentially is what a debt to GDP ratio is. Well, it, just kind of an anecdote, and I, I think I'm right on this, but when they got together in the European Union, for example, and they said, we're going to have, we're not going to have francs, we're going to have marks, we're going to have euros now. And that's an interesting thing, because now you have 17, 19-ish fiscal policies trying to blend into a single solitary monetary policy. It's an interesting thing. And they said, in order for this to work, you know, we've all got to have healthy fiscal situations. We, we wouldn't really let you into this, get this, if you have a debt to G, GDP ratio above 60, <laughs> which find me, a, find me, you know, the majority of countries don't have that. And this, this speaks to a, a very important question that I have for you is there's a point where there's a loss of confidence in a currency there's a point where inflation really takes off and it's hard to pinpoint what that is. Um, Japan has had a debt to GDP ratio of over 200 for a long, 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 long time. The U S in world war II, we had to borrow and borrow a bunch of money to fight a war. And so we got up to around 140, 150, I think the number probably was. And so when you look at that metric, you know, we got to have some meaning to that. If you say, Andy, what's your temperature? I says 98. Okay, you're fine. What's your temperature? 104. Get to the hospital now. So in order to understand the metric of temperature, we kind of got to know its consequence, right? So when you say our debt to GDP right now is about 100, um, you know, two questions. A, what is a really scary number? Uh, when you talk jet, debt to GDP, and then, uh, well, and then I'll, I'll let you answer A, and then I'll ask you B. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, because you asked a really good question, and I'll say, if I have to say one thing about how to understand sovereign debt, this $1 trillion universe of developing countries, but I think it applies to the U.S. and Japan, too, is do what you said is just forget the debt to GDP, which is a, a second order construct. Let's just mm -hmm. talk about revenue. Because what I found working with country after country, they run into trouble when interest expense as a percentage of their revenue goes over a critical level. So forget what the GDP is. It's if you bring in a, a hundred million dollars of revenue and you're spending five million, on interest expense, you have 95 left to spend other stuff on your people. But yes. if you're because you let your debt compound against you, you didn't run a surplus. So the debt got bigger and bigger and bigger. You have 20 million of debt interest, not even principal out of your 100 million, 20% of your annual resources is going. Once you get above 15, you're getting in trouble. Once you're above 20, 25, you're stressed. Once you're above 30. So if you're just looking at interest expense to revenue, you have a really big sign. And the Wall Street Journal did a great article, I think it was December, going through exactly that number for a bunch of countries, pointing out Pakistan was at about 60 and Egypt about 40 and a couple other countries. And so I would recommend people keep it simple, look at cash flow, and it's it's purely logic. If if more than a, a third is going just to interest, and remember to get that interest away, you have to start paying principal too. So yes. you have to pay the 30% in interest plus another 5% in principal every year for 10 years to work down the size of that debt. That's a very serious, what you call fiscal adjustment. And yeah. then everybody says, well, we don't want to cut our budget. It's going to hurt. We need to pay for schools and health care. But that's the issue. It's to get out of a debt trap, a debt crisis, you need to tighten your belt. And that's I'm what gonna, it's Yeah. I'm going to uh, throw out this postulate. I'm going to throw a question yeah. out there. Let's say that you have uh, three things 
uh, in play. You could, you know, you have this budget and you're going to try and balance it, or you're going to try to repair it. You're going to try to make it better. And there's three things you could do. First, you could spend less. You know, in my house, uh, yeah. I can I can spend less. I can spend less money, uh, or I can, you know, and in in the political arena, you know, maybe one side says cut your spending, and then the other side of the coin says, well, cut taxes, right, or or raise taxes rather. So you could cut spending and raise taxes, right, earn more, or you can grow the GDP and say, look. If we grow the GDP, the whole pie is bigger and we have more to tax and more to spend. And, and that. But there is a point I think we're talking about where the numbers and the obligations can get so large. Like it, 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 there's kind of a tipping point, a critical mass or whatever you want to call it, where the, the ability to, to, ta to, to raise taxes, there's just not enough money there in the GDP to do it. The, you cut spending, there's not enough spending could do the numbers are too big and our capacity for growth does have a limit there is a limit to what can the goods and services that can be purchased in a finite world so is there a point that it becomes past the point of no return uh david walker the comptroller general of the united states quit his job david walker was the lead, nation's lead accountant and he worked under both uh, like Clinton administrations and Bush administrations. He, he was very much a bipartisan guy and he quit his job and discussed. And he said, look, there is a point where we have to act like soon or we will not be able to grow our way out of this problem, reduce tax our way out of this problem or reduce spend out of way of the, or increase taxes or reduce spending. Is that critical mass real or is that just uh Oh, the chicken little, the sky is falling and the sky is falling. Or is though are those numbers real? Yeah. Is there I think, a point of no return? Is the no, short I, we're not we're not there. It's a serious issue. Former Secretary of Treasury Robert Rubin was talking in Bloomberg yesterday about fiscal issues. That's real. But let me add something co colorful and interesting, because these two Harvard professors wrote this history of all the government debt and all of human history and all their defaults. It's quite a tome. Yeah. I'll give yeah. you the short version. Um, it's called This Time is Different. Basically, every country in the world, Germany, France, US, UK, everybody's defaulted. And what happens is, as I described, it's horrible. And at a certain point, after going through one of these horrible crises, the people say, let's never do this again. We don't want to get close. So they graduate. They develop a set of institutions and practices and laws that keep them away from the edge. And what's interesting in this sovereign debt world with the Brady plans, since the mid 90s, Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, Chile, Panama, Peru, these countries are not getting in trouble because. You know why they don't like Brady like debt restructuring besides the budget cuts? Because when you get in trouble, you run to the IMF for help. And when your politicians can't come up with their economists, we're going to grow out of it, we're going to cut out of it, whatever that story is, they yeah. lose all credibility. And these foreign experts from Washington come down and tell you what to do. And that makes everybody really mad and insulted because they're proud. And they're like, we yeah. never want the IMF to come again. But when you mess up so badly that all your economists and all your experts and all your political class lose credibility, the foreigners come in, they develop a model with you, and their bean counters stay in your country for three years in every ministry counting every dollar you spend. And you have to have quarterly report cards to the board of the IMF. It's a great system. It's much vilified. But when you have a country that's messed up, it's a very well-designed system to get them back to being a normal financial entity. After graduating, the Mexicos of the world never want to go back. The mystery is, well, having gone through it, why is Argentina defaulted in 2001? Why did it default in my book? under court order in this lawsuit with the holdout hedge funds in 2014. 
Why did it restructure again in 2020? Why is Venezuela having this maximum yeah. default known for years? So what makes difference? Most countries graduating, but a few countries making policy choices and mistakes where they're backsliding. And what's sad now to say is Argentina has a lot of political partisanship. And partisanship leads to overspending. Overspending mm -hmm. leads to, to either more debt and defaults or more money printing and inflation. And that's why they're in trouble again. And so we're unfortunately, we have a partisanship problem. Do we have Huge. a debt problem? Not right now. So I'm much more worried about the lack of civility, the lack of normal process, the lack of mature scientific discussion of planning for the medium term. And so I don't want to be partisan about taxes or spending. My call is to just get everybody to not treat compromise as a dirty word. This is a difficult uh, balance because, for example, if I look at my friends, well, I shouldn't say my friends, my esteemed, uh, uh, I don't know, contemporaries like David Ramsey and Susie Orman, you know, it's a debt, debt, bad, bad, bad. I've created a lot of wealth in my life by borrowing money and buying a house and renting it and providing housing that's affordable and fair to people. And that debt has been wise debt. It's, it's an accelerator of wealth. And if a country doesn't do that, they, they, it, they, they're just, they're going to, they're going to remain what people might call third world. You've got to have investment uh, to do this. And it's got to be responsible. That's why sovereign debt is, could be a really good thing over, you know, if you go with austerity measures that are just completely too far away from this, because you're afraid of it, you're not going to develop. You have to have some debt if you're going to keep up the world and debt is, is, was required in world war two. And in my opinion, it would be required today. Think of the race for AI. Talk about a Sputnik space race. You know, yeah. the race to the moon was one thing, but the race, the AI, can the U.S. afford to let China really develop AI at a faster rate than we do? So investment to accelerate and to compete, you know, it, it isn't, you just can't say, well, we're going to have our austerity. We're just not going to, debt's a dirty word. Debt's an, it's like fire not really good or bad it can heat your home it can defend the bear but it can burn you too so the problem politicians have is they care about votes <laughs> more than than balance perhaps and whether you're on the left or the right it just gets very difficult part of i part of the reason i think default the landmark court battle over argentina's uh, 100 billion dollar debt restructuring the reason you go to amazon.com and you buy this book is because I really don't care how you want to vote when you go in the voting book. That's your right and vote your conscience. But my word, please try to get as much knowledge as you can about policy so you have a, a really good judgment about what you what you feel policy wise policy would would be. Um, whether you whether you want to go on one side of the aisle or the other, but please. Uh, be as educated as possible. If you're going to care about monetary policy, learn what it is, look at some case studies of what's done and say, do I see any mistakes down there that I would like to avoid? Um, comments on that. On, on, let's talk about the general education of an electorate. Would that have helped Argentina? If Argentina, what I, I picture the Argentine people how many of those guys really understood? I'll tell you, I think they learn it better in the United States if you've had to deal with it. If you have, you know, thousand percent inflation, you probably have learned a little bit about it more than maybe U.S. citizens have. Well, I think uh, that's a good transition to the book a bit is I realize this is a, a technical topic, having a country default. We're talking about a debt restructuring. We're talking about a court battle. But something I did is I feel strongly people need to understand this. So when I set out to write it, I said, I want to make this fun. I want to make this readable. And I wanted to make it like 
You know, the big short. My dentist asked me, what's your, it yes. says on your form, you're a writer. What did you write it back about? And so I got like 30 seconds and I said, well, you know, the big short. He said, yeah. And I said, it's a movie about how a small band of hedge fund made billions off the credit crisis. And yeah. I said, well, I wrote a book about how a small band of hedge funds made billions off of Argentina's default of 2001. He said, oh, I'll buy it. So I really did write it as narrative history, bringing readers in the room as Argentina defaults, as it fights with the IMF over its program, which budget line items to cut, fights with creditors because Argentina wants to give it a three quarters haircut and the creditors want a third haircut, billions at stake. And then a lot of people don't agree. And then there's this huge lawsuit with this cranky New York judge who rants all the time, Judge Thomas B. Crisset, who hears these cases for 15 years. And it's mostly about how he hears these two sides. Argentina, these holdout hedge funds shouldn't get a better deal than everyone else. And the hedge funds say contracts must be honored. And it goes on and on and on. He gets really mad at his lack of a bankruptcy law, but he gets really mad at Argentina for not helping him solve the problem. And he throws the book at Argentina, making an extraordinary blockade of its ability to finance. It all blows up. Everybody's defaulted on. And then it takes a new government in 2015 of Mauricio Macri, who get this, sends his new secretary of treasury Secretary of Finance and Undersecretary to New York and says, clean up this litigation. He sends them, and in a month, they convince the court, in two months, to back off this big ruling and force a really good deal, a big discount on the claims. And remarkably, those two people who cut that deal for Macri are now the new Minister of Economy for Argentina under Millet and the head of the central bank. And so there's a direct tie to current events. I know it's a hard topic and it has a lot of policy lessons in it, but I tried my best to make it like a story so that it's you can enjoy reading it. You're meeting yes. characters while they're fighting high stakes battles about important issues rather than a lot of lecturing. You can you can hit the mark with that because every every uh, history story has a narrative. It is a story. It yeah. is a narrative. It is a story. Uh, let me ask you this, and you know, in trying to be nonpartisan, you know, there there's one policy that I've struggled with, and I've I've worked very hard to be open to it and say, look, maybe I'm just not seeing it. But there's there's one policy I really have struggled with, and it's interesting because. I've interviewed PhDs from you know Berkeley and Duke and and guys that are from very liberal schools, and yet when I ask them this, they they tend to run a little bit more to the right. And so I want to figure this out. There was a, a bond trader that you're probably familiar with, Warren Mosler, and Warren Mosler, uh, he, it was it was in he was trading bonds way back then, way back when I believe they were Spain. I think it was Spanish. And he made a name for himself by saying, look, no one's going to default because anyone can print money to, to uh, you know, we're talking about government debt now, right? They can, they can answer their own bonds because they can print money to do that. There's no risk of default. And he said, really, this is about taxes. Um, if you can, you can control uh, this with taxes because if the government says, look, you have to pay me in U.S. dollars. Uh, you know, now you've got control of it because a guy can't pay with Bitcoin. He can't pay with gold. There's an inherent value to a U.S. dollar now because if you have to pay in U.S. dollars, you have to go get them, thus creating demand for a dollar. And he was the father of, of something called modern monetary theory. And uh, basically, you know, one of, one of his followers, Stephanie Kelton, she wrote a book called The Deficit Myth that says the deficit is of no consequence. Now I, I can see as a business owner, I have to manage debt. As a government, you have to manage inflation because you can print money, right? Yeah. You can print money. And so my question to you is, is 
you know, why is there a credit default swap? Why is there insurance on government debt if a person cannot, uh, or if a government cannot default, why would you have a credit default swap? Would you care to comment just briefly on your take on MMT? Is that something we need to listen to and come to the edge and not judge on yet? Or is that one we need to move on from to, to have a serious conversation? I, I would say I'm not a big fan. I'm with former Secretary Rubin. Deficits matter. You just can't print money. That's just another form of default. You're going to create okay. inflation when you print money. You're going to pay people back and devalued. If you borrow in a foreign currency, like in the sovereign debt market, you try that in a small country, you default on your foreign claims. You create costs. You know, most households, we're normal people. We don't want to worry about money. That's just like water utility. We want to build houses. We want to be a doctor. We want to be a physical therapist. We work at the store. We want to have neighbors and be normal people or be an educator. What happens in a disrupted country like Argentina in the 80s, hyperinflation, people say, I'm going to the store and I'm buying five bottles of shampoo because the price will be higher this afternoon. So economic agents are spending their whole time gaming financial disruption and not doing productive things. And so I'm very wary of economists and other people with one big idea, because in effect, when the IMF goes to a country, it's not one big idea. It's basic accountancy, basic spending controls, not printing too much money, not spending too much. It's boring. But if someone came into your household with some magical solution to make it easy, I think that your common wisdom will be it sounds don't, a little too good to be true. Don't take yeah. the get rich quick scheme. And the easy, the something for nothing scheme, really. I mean, it's a big deal. Let's finish up with this. Why read default landmark court battle over Argentina's $100 billion uh, debt restructuring? There's two reasons, I think, at a minimum. And, and there's probably more, but there's two big ones where I think people study this and, and read a book like this. Number one is there's a collectivism and a and a cultural a cultural political will to solve problems and to have goodwill and and culture is more important than policy any day of the week if you have a strong culture and people are educated they can vote better so if we want to try to solve this problem systemically of debt in the united states i mean you know we're our our bonds are paying out more interest now than they used to. I mean, you know, four or five percent is a lot more than one or a quarter point, right? The 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 rates matter when you talked about that. So it can help us systemically. The more educated and electorate is, the better chance we have of solving the systemic problem. However, and I might be a little bit jaded and pessimistic, knowing how politicians operate and that they care about votes more than anything else. Uh, they'll tend to roll snowballs up the hill and kick cans down the road. They really will. When I look at this as an individual solution, I might read this book and have a wake-up call and say, I'm grateful for understanding what this can look like. I care about it. And in the event that there is a failure systemically, as there was in Argentina, they could not fix their system. What can I do as a household so I can have shampoo and it's not going up and I can have diapers and maybe more importantly, food, clothing, shelter, and medicine. Um, what would you do if you were put in a time capsule with your family and you were put back in the 1990s, let's say in Argentina, uh, what would you have done as a family, as an investor uh, outside of moving to the United States what would you have done to prepare for that as an individual if you felt that the systemic problem was unlikely to be solved? That's a tough question, I think. But I, I think one people would really like to hear. If I put you in a time machine with you and your family, put you back in Argentina during this crisis, what would you have done to prepare as an individual? Well, I think the big question you have, which every 
anybody with an increment of extra money has is, are you going to go with real assets? Or are you going to go with financial assets? Or are you going to go with crypto assets? I mean, I'm a big fan of real assets. And real assets within, which you can see, you know, as you said, if you, you've got an extra room you can rent out in the back of your house, that's income and it's under your control. And there's always someone selling you a pump and dump scene or something. And so um, in Argentina, the rich people, the problem is they get excited about a government and hundreds of billions rolls into the country. And then they get scared and hundreds of billion runs out breaking the currency. And so yeah. it's kind of a social conflict in that the workers in the city and the poor people and the rich people who own a lot of land, they're not getting along. And so the investment money is running away. It's kind of like they have to have a social contract. And so I think for moderate means people don't get caught up in the promises of things you can't control unless it's really transparent. So I like simple products. I like transparent projects. I like, I prefer regulated products um, for my liquidity. I'm very happy with a deposit in a JP Morgan. Um, and um, so what I would say is, is be careful. And the most important thing is your job in increasing your own personal um, human capital so that you fit in society, that you can get employed, that you have more knowledge or in a knowledge-based economy because then you'll always be needed. And I think what happens is some people get comfortable in good times of the 90s and the cash flows are all fine. And then the government turns into chaos and they get kind of tossed aside. Or there's a class of like older men. It happened in Puerto Rico. A lot of middle-aged men got unemployed and couldn't get out. And so I think between the hard assets and hum continued social networking and human capital development is the best defense for for one's life and no, diversification sure. diversification always don't put too much in one in one little dream crypto is a different topic for a different day but it is fascinating to me that people would run to crypto for stability i mean if <laughs> if if you look at a chart of crypto and see its volatility. And then if you're in Argentina and you're flying to crypto, that tells you really where you are. Uh, when you see when you see a crypto as a stable thing, it tells you where you came from. That's for sure. I'll tell you, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, you want to put yeah. your cash in crypto, not the local currency. Yeah. There's a real demand for an asset like that. In the United States, I'm not convinced, but there's a real demand for that. So uh, we'll talk about that on another day. Sovereign yeah. bonds versus crypto. But it's been really fun talking. This has been a great conversation. Incredible. Incredible. You've been so gracious with your time. What I've loved most is uh, your humanity. And that this is a, you, you talk to a PhD and you think you can talk about the numbers and physics and stuff. But the human uh, concern that you started with is a good place to end. Go to amazon.com order default, the landmark court battle over Argentina's $100 billion debt restructuring. And you can also go to the website, it's uh, defaultthebook.com. Yes, is that correct? Yes. Yes. Defaultthebook.com. I hope I can have you back someday. You're, you're not just a, a wealth of knowledge, but you're just a delightful uh, personality, a delightful human being. Any last words for uh, for our audience as we try to navigate uh, this world? You know, there's four trillion dollars now in the credit in uh, I believe you know credit default swaps. That's an insurance. If you're paying that much for insurance, there's probably a danger. Any last words for 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 our folks? No, thank you, and I hope we find another topic to talk about soon. Okay, hang on just a bit after I close the show so I can properly thank you. You've been listening to the Cashflow Academy uh, podcast. And uh, go by, again, let me give my website a plug, uh, yourinvestingclass.com. Hope you enjoyed our conversation. We'll see you next time.